I want to tell you a couple of things um, before I really get into my sermon. Um, I'm going to try to say this, this quickly concerning your new year. Every, everyone desires something new in their life. They're optimistic about change and the possibilities they can experience in a new year. Every one of us wants to have a great new year. Every one of us in here wants a great 2020. We don't want to have a bad 2020. We don't want to have a bad, you know, year. Who wants to do that? Nobody goes into that, okay? So we're optimistic and we make goals and we make resolutions and all these different things. But there's a couple of things I want to say. Is if you want to experience something new or go somewhere you've never gone before, you're going to have to do some things. And I just put four. There's more. But you're going to have to do this, th these things. The first thing I want to say to you, if you want to experience something in 2020 that you didn't experience in 2019, here's the first thing that you're going to have to do. You're going to have to be clear about where you're going. Be clear about where you're going. Nobody gets into a car and says, you know, uh, we're, we're just going nowhere. We're just going to drive around in circles. No, you get into a car to go to a certain destination. So in 2020, if, you, if there's something you want to accomplish, if there's something that you want to see, anything like that, you want to experience something different in your year, you're going to have to be clear about that. You, you know, write some things down. Have vision for things, amen? Aim for something. If I could grab a bow and arrow and I just say, I'm going to hit the target, but there's no, there's no bullseye anywhere around, there, I'm not going to hit it. But when you set a bullseye for something, you can hit it, amen? The, the second thing that I challenge you to do is to evaluate. Evaluate. What did you do this year that in, that in hindsight you would have changed to see a different result? Right? You guys know what the definition of insanity is, right? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Amen? Oh, can you guys do something? I want to make sure you guys say hi to my mother-in-law. She's visiting from Brazil. Amen? Yeah, Maria. Make sure you guys say hi to her after, after service. Amen? Um, so so you, you need to uh, evaluate what, what did you do. Like, what was something you know, really terrible or negative or something that happened in your life this year that you can make a change. Let me, let me, let me give you just, a, 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 just an example off the top of my head. So when your account goes below zero in your bank account, that's called an NSF, insufficient funds, okay? If you had several of those in the year, let's just say you have a problem with keeping track of your checkbook, you know, and so, and so you keep going under, but it's really not because you don't have the money, it's just that you're not balancing things out the right way, and let's say that happened three times, so three times 35, you know, what is that, what, is that 105, you know, so, so, so that's $105 you could have had back in 2019 if you just kept better track of deposits and, and, and outgoing funds, right? Amen? It's just something simple, but do you see what I'm saying? But if you don't make a change this year, you're going to have more NSFs this year, right? All right? So, so evaluate. The third thing, this is really important, is be honest. Be honest with yourself. You can throw out all kinds of resolutions, but be honest. Are you willing to make the necessary changes? Are you willing to make the necessary changes? You know, can you, can you tackle sugar? Can you tackle sugar? Can you, can, you make, can you truly make a decision? I'm not going to have sugar this year. You know, can you do that? Can, can you say, I'm going to cut soda out of, I, I'm using an example of when we make resolutions and, and, and set our faith. Listen, I'm setting my faith to the physical as well. I'm not only praying for spiritual things, I'm praying for natural things. You know, I've been swimming, but now I'm going to start adding weight training. I'm going to start running. I've already started that, you know. So why am I doing that? Because there's a result that I want to see. Amen. And so, so, so I've already started adding to that and setting my faith to that, but it's going to have to take, you know, you being honest with yourself and saying, because it's not just going to happen just like that. So what, what, what happened this year that if you had the knowledge to go back and say, okay, I, I want to keep this from happening, well, what can you keep from happening in 2020 that you couldn't help in 2019? Does it make sense? Come on now, all right? Last thing, Recog this is powerful. I could preach a whole message on this. Recognize the familiar. Let me go into this real quick. When you're going to a new place, you will always face resistance. You're going to always face giants. Amen? A new place with the blessing will have new giants. 
right? The children of Israel, you know, the, the, you know what God told them? God didn't tell them about the giants. He told them all he said, that land is a land that's flowing with milk and honey. And, he's, and, and they went to go check it out. Out of 12 people who checked out the land, only two people, Joshua and Caleb, said, hey, if God said it, we're going to do it. We can conquer these giants. Everyone else was afraid of the giants that comes with new blessing and new territory. Come on, y'all. Amen. Amen? So we all want the new. We just don't want to face any giants. And I want to challenge you today that the Lord is saying, don't run away from resistance. America is one of the most, like any form of resistance, we run away from it. Resistance is what causes you to grow. If I grab a dumbbell and I grab 10 pounds, well, well, well if, if I have the dumbbell right here and I go like this, that's not the part that makes me strong. It's the part where I lift it like this, right? It's not this part. It's this part. Why? Because there's resistance there's 10 pounds of resistance going on my bicep, amen? Don't run from resistance. There is always a temptation to return to what is familiar. Uh, the children of Israel wanted to go back to Egypt. Um, this happens a lot too. Listen, there's a, there's a psychological reason this happens. You break up with your boyfriend, you break up with your girlfriend, and what do you do? You, you go back to the guy or the girl you were dating before. Why? Because it's familiar, amen? You know how many, how many adulterous affairs have taken place on Facebook? You know why? Because the married person that has kids and, and bills and responsibilities sees his old girlfriend on, on, on uh, Facebook or Instagram or whatever, and then he you know, sends a message to say, hey, how are you, whatever. And the, you know what he does? He, what he does is he reverts to a time. Think about this. What problems did he have when he was dating his girlfriend? Man, they were having sex, no responsibilities, just go to school. Uh, his bills were being paid. He had breakfast on the Mom brought breakfast on the table. It was a great, great time, right? Because there was no responsibilities. Now he's married, has children. And so he's like, what does he do? He reverts to something that was familiar. Come on, church. And reverting to what's familiar can get you into trouble. It could cause you to go backwards, Amen. Um, you know, uh, as we have to be conscious of what's going on around this church. Amen? We have to be conscious of what's going on around us because if you're going to see uh, uh, a new season in your life, you're going to have to divorce yourself from the familiar. Divorce yourself from the familiar. There's some people you need to stop hanging out with. They are just dragging you down. And there's some people you need to start hanging out with that they need to lift you up. If you're the smartest guy in or smartest girl in your group, you need to find some more friends. Seriously, you need to find some more friends because you need people to lift you up, right? Come on now. God is good. Listen, I want to talk to you. This is my message today. I wanted to speak those four things to you about your new year. But I want to uh, speak a message that I've done before here at New Dawn and at other places but I want to talk to you about six encounters with Jesus. Amen. And then I want to pray for you. Six encounters with Jesus. I don't like to preach messages where um, I give a form of an opinion. Um, and uh, because I just believe the word of God stands alone. But I am going to give you an opinion based on 25, uh, 20, 24 years of full-time ministry. Uh, whether it was a youth pastor, whether it was missions, whether it was evangelistic, whether it was traveling you know, around the world doing things. I'm, I have experience. And I want to say this to you, that uh, I have a good gauge on what I'm going to say to you in this respect. But there's, 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 I want to talk about these six encounters with Jesus. The first one is Jesus is my Savior, your encounter with Jesus as my Savior. So what is that? You receive Jesus Christ into your life, right? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, what? That he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Amen? If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you put your faith in him for the salvation of your souls, what does the Bible say? That your sins are are made clean, right? The blood of Jesus washes your sins. So the first encounter, and it's actually the, the uh, I'm not even going to say it's the most important, but you need it to have a life in Christianity or a life in Christ, and that is salvation. Amen? So Jesus is my Savior. The second thing that I see happen with believers, it's really funny uh, when they receive Christ, and I, and I just use this term, Jesus is my buddy. 
Jesus is my buddy. And so what do you mean by that, Pastor? I, I'm amazed when I see new believers get saved. It seems like God in their life, like he's everywhere they turn, God is there. God is there. God is doing something. Uh, they mess up and fall. God is just right there. Uh, God has a lot of grace. Hear me, church. God has a lot of grace in when people are first getting to know the Lord because, you know, he, your mind has to be transformed, right? You have to get the word in your heart. You have to start developing discipline. And so there's a lot of grace. And so uh, the scripture that I have is Proverbs 18.24. It says, a man of too many friends comes to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Amen? How many of you guys know that Jesus is our friend? He is. He's there. He'll, the Bible says he'll never leave us and he'll never forsake us. So, so we said, first one, Jesus is my Savior. Second one, Jesus is my friend or Jesus is my buddy. And then we begin to grow more. And I would say that Jesus is my rock. Jesus becomes my rock. And what does that mean? That's where trust begins to kick in. Let me read these scriptures to you. Proverbs, uh, well, a lot of you guys know this, Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will, what, direct your path, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Um, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 says this. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Come on, he who promised is faithful. He who promised is faithful. You begin to believe that. And so Jesus becomes a rock. He becomes a solid place because you believe, begin to believe he's faithful. 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3, verse 3. The Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. Come on now. The Lord is faithful. He'll establish you and keep you, protect you from the evil one. Let me tell you something. I pray that if you're in the Jesus is my buddy stage, that you get to the Jesus is my rock stage because you need to know that he is a firm foundation and that he is there to protect you from the evil one. It is very ignorant for a person to believe that Satan and demonic activity does not exist. It is very real. Demonic activity is real. And, 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 and when you have power in Christ, you have all authority to defeat the power of the enemy. Amen? Jesus is my Lord. This is the, the fourth one. Jesus becomes my Lord. Now, this is where real discipline begins to take place in our life. Luke 9, 21 uh, to 25. Luke chapter 9, verses 21 to 20, 25. It's, uh, Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Hallelujah. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Let me read that again. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. The word, the, the, the word disciple is the root word where we get the word discipline. Amen? So if you're going to be a disciple of Christ, amen, he says you must lay yourself down, lay your life down, and, and, and surrender your will to the Lord. Take up your cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit? their very own soul. What good is it to gain the whole world and lose your own soul? My wife and I were talking about someone yesterday, and I told them, and I really believe this, I'd rather be dead and with God than to be alive and separated from him. I'd rather be dead physically with knowing that I'm with God than to be alive on this earth and never say yes to Jesus Christ. And, 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 and one day die and live a separated life for him. I mean that. I'd rather be with the Lord. Amen. Colossians chapter 3, verses 2 to 4. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. I want to read that one more time before I go to Acts uh, um, uh, the book of Acts. Well, no, you know what? I'm going to stay right here. Let me read that one more time. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, 
and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Amen. Let me go to number five right here. Number five is Jesus is my standard. Jesus is my standard. And so uh, I do find it that very few people uh, live their lives according to this. And when I say this, church, when I say this to you, this is not a put down. I'm not putting anyone down. It's just an observation of ministry. Amen. Because how many of you guys know that receiving Jesus into your heart is the greatest gift, the greatest miracle that there ever was is to say yes to Jesus, meet it in your heart and, and, and be born again. Right. But I'll tell you, being born again is just the opening door. God wants so much more. And so what does Jesus is my standard mean? Jesus is my standard. And in Colossians uh, 3, verse 1, it says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So now, when Jesus becomes your standard, you don't view things like this. Come on, church, follow me. You don't view things like this. You view things like this. Because your viewpoint is heaven. You begin to view things not by what the world standard is. You begin to view it by the kingdom of God. Amen? The, the, the Bible says those who are led by the spirit of God are the sons of God. So that's why what Chevy was talking about the other day, me and my wife were at the mall, and we were going through the food court. There was three young men, uh, 20-somethings, sitting there. And I told my wife, just give me one second. And the Lord asked, told me to, to ask them if they need prayer. When, 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 you at, when you are led by the spirit of God, you become a kingdom person and now power and authority becomes available to you in such a great way and you become sensitive to things church all right Galatians 3 27 says for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ all of you were baptized into Christ you've clothed yourselves with Christ John 14 verses 12 to 13 this is so good most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. When you have kingdom perspective, you all of a sudden feel like God has your back the second you say the name of Jesus. Amen? One of those most powerful movies I saw was a secular movie, and I'm trying to remember, it was a vampire movie, it scared the bejeebies out of me. I remember when I was a little, but I remember when, when this, uh, this uh, warlock, it was a warlock uh, uh, person, and uh, he was there, and then over there was a guy and a priest, and uh, the warlock starts getting closer to, to, to the two men, and the priest reaches into his, uh, into his garment and takes out a cross. And you know what the warlock does? The warlock goes over to the priest, and he grabs the, the cross, and he crushes it. And he says, you have to have faith to use that. A cross symbol cannot save you. But when you have faith in the power of the name of Jesus, that's where power is, comes from. When you begin to, to use the name of Jesus and you begin to understand that you are God's kid, that is kingdom authority. And most people don't teach on that. You know what we teach? We teach about Jesus as my buddy. We, 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 we're okay with Jesus being my buddy, that level. You know why? Because every time you challenge people, there's the possibility that they're not going to like what you say. And so either you have two choices as a preacher. You're either afraid of the people or you're afraid of God. You can't have both. So either, and I don't fear God like, like he's going to get me. I respect God. And I say, God, what is it that you want to do? So if I'm moved by people, hey, not everyone's going to like this message. I can guarantee it right now, not everyone's going to like this message. But I don't have a choice. Amen? I could submit to the popular, the, the popular thing of just, Pastor, just tell me everything's going to be okay. Just tell me I'm going to have a great year. Come on, just preach some kind of message. Let me tell you something. If you take what I'm, what I'm teaching you today, you will have a great year. And that devil who's a liar and who's out to steal, to kill, and to destroy, you're going to crush his head underneath your feet. But you can't do that in the area of Jesus is my buddy. Come on now. You have to understand who you are. That's the difference. Amen? Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. 
You shall receive power and you will be my witnesses. When you begin to step out of yourself to minister to others, listen, the Holy Spirit in me is for me. Thank God his presence is in me. But when the Holy Spirit is on me, it's for other people. And I begin to walk in the heart of God. I begin to walk in the love of God. I remember when I was little, I want to keep these comments short, but I remember I would go to, uh, they have Winn-Dixie here, right? Do they have Winn-Dixie? They don't have the supermarket. That's an East Coast supermarket. Uh, so uh, on the East Coast, there was this Winn-Dixie that me and my friends would ride to, LaDonna, and we would go get snacks from the Winn-Dixie. We would ride our bikes, and next to Winn-Dixie, there was this building that had, like, you know how you put, like, that... Uh, that, uh, that plastic film over windows so you can't see in it. So there was this building that had this silver tint, and I always wondered what it was. And I saw people going in. I saw people going out. And we, over the years, I'd ride my bike, go to Winn-Dixie, you know, Geo, get some chips and a Mr. Juicy. I don't know if they have Mr. Juicy anymore. But anyway, so I go get a Mr. Juicy or an ice cream or a devil dog or yeah, anybody eat all that stuff. I was a chubby little kid, let me tell you. Listen, so I ride my bike. People going in, people going out. Listen, I was 19 years old when I found out that the church where I was going to, my pastor, his brother had that church over there. And you know what I thought to myself? Not one time did anyone from the parking lot as they were going into church take time to talk to this little Spanish kid and just say, hey, young man, what's your name? Oh, Irwin. Listen, do you know that God loves you? Not one time did anyone over years and years of Wednesday night services, Sunday services, did any person take the time to tell me how God loved me. Do you know the crap that I did from 15 to 19? Do you know the stuff that could have kept me out of trouble, excuse my language, could have kept me out of trouble had they just shared with me about the love of God? Because I believe my heart would have been open. I believe I was looking for it. I just didn't know what it was. Amen? The power of God will cause you to step out of yourself, the Holy Spirit, and minister to other people. Amen? Last thing I want to talk to you about is this. is Jesus is fire. Jesus is fire. Jamila, if you could just come help me. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 says this. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Do you know who the baptizer of the Holy Spirit and fire is? His name is Jesus. And do you know where he baptizes people in the Holy Spirit and fire? He doesn't do it when he was walking around on the earth like that. You know what he does? He does it from heaven. The Bible says, he sit, the Bible says he sits on the right hand of the Father praying for you and for me. Do you know he's praying for this service even right now? And he is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit and with fire. And you know what? When I pray for you in a little bit, you know what I'm praying? I pray. I'm not praying about your needs, even though I will believe with you for your needs. But you know what I'm praying? I'm praying that God will get a hold of your heart like he's never gotten a hold of your heart before. That you will surrender to him. Because I want to say this to you as a person, a human being that walks on this earth. I've experienced a lot of things. I've done a lot of things. I've lived a life. I've, I've, I've gone to the best clubs, walk, been walked into the back of the clubs with, with a whole entourage of 20, 30 people following, got it in for free, you know, been with my friends as they're, they're doing their concerts and big places and doing all these things and, and just experiencing all the things of the world. And I want to tell you that I would never, ever desire to go back to that because I've experienced someone, not something, not a religion, I've experienced someone, his name is Jesus. And I pray that hunger would fill your heart this morning, that you would say, Lord, fill me this morning. Fill me this morning. I don't want Jesus just to be my, just my savior. I don't want him to just be my buddy. I don't want him to just be my Lord or even my standard. I want him to be fire in my life. That I'm, I'm willing and saying, God, whatever you want, Whatever you want to do in my life, 
Revelations chapter 1, verses 10 to 15. It says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. We go to verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool and and white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Hebrews chapter 12, and I'll finish with this, verses 28 to 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God. Listen to this, church. Let's worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. Whether it's Thailand, Las Vegas, I'm going to get a little raw with you. Whether it's Thailand or Las Vegas or different places, Mexico, where prostitution and, and um, um, uh, uh, what is it called when they, when, when they, sex trafficking, yes, all of that is prevalent, you can land in our own country of Las Vegas. And in the taxi drivers, the back of the thing, there's a book. And you can pull that book out and you can see different prostitutes if you want to be with that prostitute. You can pick the prostitute that you want. Happens in Europe, happens all over the world. And the thing is, is that you would think like, like these guys that do that with these prostitutes, they're like picking their type, right? You ever heard that? Oh, that's my type, right? Do you know actually what's really going on most of the time with that when they pick a certain look? You know what they're doing? They're reverting to someone in their life, in their past. They're trying to pick someone that they dated or infatuated with to try to experience with that person what they had in their mind. Come on now. That's what's, that's what's happening. I've talked with men that I, I've asked them the question, like, just ask, like, why did you do that weird thing? And when they told me, it always reverted to someone that they knew. So they're just trying to recreate that thing. Prostitutes share the fact that sometimes they'll have, the, the man will say, can you put on a, a, a red wig? Or a, a black wig or this, you know, you know why? Because they're reverting to something. Let me say this to you. This may be, you may think is an odd example, but this is what the Holy Spirit gave me. You know what happens when you have an encounter with the Holy Spirit? You will never settle for anything less than that. You will nettle, never settle for dryness. You will never settle for Jesus just being your buddy. You'll never settle for just walking on this earth and just wearing a cross on your neck and just say, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm, I'm born again. You'll never settle. Because when you have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, everywhere you go, you're going to look in the book of life. And you're going to be like, where is the Holy Spirit moving in my life? Where is the Holy Spirit moving? And I want to say to you, I am doomed. What do you mean by that, Pastor? I'm doomed. You know why? Because I've tasted, and I can't ever go back to a dry place. I won't. I refuse because I have I had an encounter with God. And I just challenge you. I don't, I don't, I don't know where you're at. I'm going to repeat these in order again, and then I'm going to pray for you. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my buddy. Jesus is my rock. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my standard, and Jesus is fire. I don't know where you're at with all this, but I challenge you that wherever you are, I challenge you today that you would have faith to go to the next level. Amen?